right, welcome to notes 10.1 to 3. The unit that we're beginning is all about circles, and it's about the segments of circles and the uh, angles that are formed by those segments and the properties that involve all of those things. So probably a lot of new material to you, although some, some things will just be a review, but mostly new. Uh, as always, let's begin with some vocabulary. So the first segment we're going to talk about is a chord. And a chord is a segment whose endpoints are on the circle. So if I were to draw an example of that, I've got a circle, oops, which is a little bit off the page, hang on. All right. And then I were to draw, let's try to find one without arrows. All right. So here's my line segment. The both endpoints are on the circle. Uh, so this blue right here is a chord. All right. And then let's talk about tangents. Tangents are a line or a ray or a segment in the plane of a circle that intersects the circle at exactly one point. So a line or any parts of a line. So what this one would look like is a circle right here, and then I'll get my line, and it would intersect at exactly one point. So this point right here would be the point of tangency, and this line would be the tangent line. All right, and then let's talk secant. So a secant is a line that intersects a circle at two points. So a chord is part of a secant. The difference between a secant and a chord is that the secant goes through the circle, whereas a chord just has both endpoints on the circle. So that line right there would be a secant, and it intersects it at two points. So given those definitions that I just gave you and the pictures that I just drew, I would like you to identify uh, whether each of these figures is a radius, which you remember begins at the center of a circle and goes to the circle, a chord, two endpoints on the circle, a diameter, which would be a chord that goes through the center of a circle, a secant, which is a line that intersects a circle in two points, or a tangent, which is a line that intersects a circle at one point. So go ahead and tell me what each of these things are. Um, and then come back when you're ready to check your answers. Hit pause now. All right, so you should have gotten that segment BC was a radius because it's from the edge of the circle to the center. Uh, line EA, EA was a secant because it intersected the circle at two points, at point A and point F. And DE, ray, DE was a tangent because it intersected the circle at one point, point B. All right, moving down to here, we need to tell how many common tangents the circle has, the circles have, and draw them. All right, so a common tangent is a line that is tangent to two or more circles. So I would like you to think about how many tangents you think A has, common tangents, how many you think B has, and how many you think C has. Go ahead and write the number down, and then come back and check your answer, and then we'll go ahead and draw them. So please hit pause now. Okay, so A here actually has three common tangents. Did you get that? If you did, good job. There is one down each side, and these are a little hard to draw with these line things, so um, you'll have to bear with me here. So it's like, oh, did you get the point? They intersect at two points. And then a second one that intersects on this side, and then there's a third one, since these two circles intersect at a single point, there's a third one that also goes through that single point. So that's where the three uh, common tangents come from. All right, this guy here, it only has two common tangents, and those are the ones that run along the sides. Again, this is going to be difficult to draw, so you're just going to have to bear with me here. Just assume that this one intersects at one point right here. I'm not going to mess around with the arrows anymore. All right, and then our last little friend here, because this circle is entirely inside this circle, they intersect at a single point. There is only one common tangent, and it intersects at that point where both circles intersect. So right there. All right, good. Moving on.
right, now we have a couple of theorems that contain properties of these segments that are going to be critical um, that you understand in order to be successful at solving things later on in this unit. And so the first one says, in a plane, so all of these basically, every theorem, postulate, property in this unit um, is understood to be in a plane. A line is tangent to a circle if and only if the line is perpendicular to a radius of a circle at its endpoint on the circle. So in my diagram down here, oops, didn't mean to do that. I can tell that PE is a tangent because it is perpendicular to OP at this point on the circle. All right, so only tangent if perpendicular. And then if I have um, two tangents from a common external point, so since both my tangents begin at this common point, point S, then they are congruent. Simple enough. So what this means is because if a line is tangent, it must be perpendicular to a radius, then what must be formed here by this segment, my possible tangent, and my radius must be a right triangle. If it's not, then ST is not a tangent. So we need to go ahead and check this one. Um, if you remember your Pythagorean triples, then you will very easily see that this is a 5, 12, 13 right triangle. So therefore, this is perpendicular, so ST is tangent. All right, so I would like you to check the next two. Now, let's look at this one here. I'll let you check the last one. Let's look at this one. So what we know is if ST is a tangent, then this must be a right triangle, and that's what we're checking, which means that this must be the hypotenuse. And what do we know about the hypotenuse of a right triangle? If you yelled out that it must be the longest side, then you are correct. So this 8 here must not refer to the entire length of this segment. It must refer to just this part. So how do we know how long this part is? Well, it's a radius of a circle, and we know that this radius is 5, and we know that all radiuses are congruent. So this one must also be 5. So this whole segment must be 5 plus 8, which last time I checked was 13. So again, we have a 5, 12, 13 right triangle. So therefore, again, ST is tangent. Okay, so general rule of thumb in this unit, and this is very important because we mess with you a lot on this, is if this number is smaller than this number, then it only represents the external segment. You have to go ahead and add the radius to it. If it's larger, or if it specifically states RT is whatever length, then you know that we're talking about the whole hypotenuse. All right, so you guys go ahead and check this one and tell me whether or not this is a right triangle. Come back when you have your answer. Hit pause now. All right, so in this one, if you do the math, you find out that the sum of the two legs does not equal, or the sum of the square of the two legs does not equal the square of the hypotenuse, so therefore uh, ST cannot be tangent because this is not a right angle. Good, moving on. All right, so in our next problem here, we are told that K is a point of tangency, which means that JK must be tangent to the circle, which means that LK is a radius and that these two must be perpendicular to each other. All right, so we need to find the radius R of circle L. Well, again, we've got a leg that's longer than the number here, so we know that this number can only represent the external segment, which means that the hypotenuse is really R plus 32. So we need to go ahead and set up an equation that's going to help us solve for r. Well, we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem, which says that one side squared plus the second side squared must equal the hypotenuse squared. And the hypotenuse is going to be r plus 32 squared. All right. It is really important in problems like this, and I know many of you already know this, but a few of you are still making this mistake that you understand that we don't just distribute the square sign to these two, that what this really means is r plus 32 times r plus 32. And you have to go ahead and FOIL this so you don't wind up with two terms, you wind up with three terms when you do this. 
All right, so we get r squared plus 31, 36 equals r times r is r squared. And then we get 32r plus 32r, so we get 64r. And then um, 32 squared is 1024. All right, so fortunately for us, to make our lives a lot easier, we subtract r squared from both sides, and these two guys cancel each other out. So what we really get is that, let me see, we subtract 1024 from both sides. So on this side, we get 64r, and we get uh, 2112. And so we just divide by 64. And that tells us that our 33. Simple enough. All right, so moving on to the next problem. We've got RS is tangent at point S, RT is tangent at point T, and we need to find the value of S. All right, well, what do I know about two segments that are tangent from a common point? What I know is that they are congruent. And if things are congruent, then I can set them equal to each other. So x squared equals 49, which means that x equals 7. Why does it say this? Well, the reason why it says this is because when we solve this, we solve it by taking the square root of both sides. All right. So the square root of 49 is positive 7, but it's also negative 7. Right? Because negative 7 times negative 7 is positive 49. Now, here's the catch. If x is by itself anywhere in our problem, if there's just an x, not an x squared, just an x, then the negative value can't be true because we can't have a negative length in geometry. However, the only thing in this problem is an x squared, which means that because we're always going to square the x, we can include the negative value because it will still give us the answer. So in this case, there are two values for the solution to x. Something to think about. All right, so here we have some problems. All three of these problems are very similar. And the reason why we're giving it to you three times is because you are going to see this again on, oh, let's say a quiz or a test, maybe both. Who knows? So you need to pay close attention to how to solve this problem. OK, so in the diagram, AB is a common tangent. It's tangent to both circles. And what we know about lines that are tangent is that they are perpendicular to the radius. So we know that this is true. And then we know that the radius of this is 6, and the radius of this is 8. And we need to find this slanty line here, technical term, slanty. So I want you to pause the video for a moment and think about how you would do that. So pause it now. Oops, rogue slide for a second. All right, did you come up with an answer? Uh, it's okay if you don't. A lot of students find this very not intuitive. All right, so if we draw a line parallel to this line right here uh, and from this point, so I'm going to draw a line right here that is parallel to this first line. So. Because we've done that, that means that since it's parallel, that this distance right here is also 6, and we basically have formed a rectangle. Okay. And this is a right angle, which means that this angle right here is also a right angle. And if this distance is 6, then this distance is 2. So really what we've drawn is we have drawn a triangle, a very long line here, and a very long line there, and a very short line there, a right triangle. That looks like this. This is 2. This side here, because it's offset, we've got a parallelogram going on, we've got a rectangle, is 20. And this side is x. So all we have to do now to solve for x is use the Pythagorean theorem. So we do 2 squared plus 20, oops, 20 squared equals x squared, which means we get 4 plus 400 equals x squared, so 404 equals x squared, which means that x equals
when we take the square root of both sides, we get x. Um, it equals, let me see if I factor out 4, so I get 2. That leaves me with 101 under the radical. So x equals 2, radical 101. Did you understand that? Well, let's see. I would like you to do 8 and come back when you have an answer. Hit pause now. All right, so again, you should have drawn a line parallel to the common tangent, which means that it is 24. And then if this segment is 5, then this segment is 5, and this segment is 4. So we have a 4, 24, x, right triangle. So go ahead and use the Pythagorean theorem. And when you simplify the radical, you find out that x equals 4 radical 37. Did you get that? If not, do you understand why? All right, so question number 9 works exactly the same way, and that is why I want you to do it in the notes check. All right, moving on. All right, so again, we have three of the same type of problem, which should, again, be an indicator to you that you are going to see it multiple times in various assessments. So it behooves you to know how to do it. All right, so in each diagram, a polygon circumscribes a circle. Well, to circumscribe means that the circle intersects the polygon at exactly one point. It right, fits neatly inside and it intersects each side at one point, which means what we have going on here are we have a bunch of tangents from a common external point. So, for example, this segment and this segment, those are two tangents both coming from that point. And this segment and this segment are two tangents coming from an external point, the same point. And this one and this one are also tangents. Well, how does that help us? What do we know about two tangents from a common external point? If you yelled out because you just could not control yourself that, it's, that they're congruent, then you are correct. So this is congruent to that, and this one is congruent to this one, and this one is congruent to this one. Which means that the length of this one is 12, and the length of this one is 8, and the length of this one is 13. So to find the perimeter, I just add up all of the sides. So for this one, when I add them all up, I get 66 centimeters. All right, let's try it again. So this one gets slightly more complicated. But again, we've got a circumscribed circle. So we know that, or a polygon that circumscribes a circle. We know that it intersects at these points. So we know we have a bunch of tangents going on. Well, so this one is congruent to this one. So this one is 4. But then we have lengths of whole sides over here. So I don't actually know what this piece here is. Now, it's always super tempting for kids to think that these two um, just divide in half. But that's not the case. So don't fall into that trap. However, we do know that this segment right here is 3. So it's congruent to this segment right here. So that must also be 3. Well, if that's 3 and the whole thing's 5, then this part is 2, which means that this one right here is also 2. So because these two guys are congruent, so 3 hash marks. Well, this one does just happen to divide in half. So that's just a coincidence, though. That's not the way it works. Uh, if this is 2, this is 2. And then if this is 2, then this little segment right here is also 2. And again, we just add up all of the sides. And we get 22 centimeters. All right, we're going to take a look at this third one. So let's start with what we know and what we don't know. Um, what you want to look for in a case like this is you want to look for the length of one of the tangents. And here we've got two tangents together are 8 feet, and two tangents together are 9 feet, and two tangents together are 12 feet, and then we see this little 3 feet here. Well, this, although it doesn't look like it, is just referring to this segment right here. So this segment right here, and these, these hash marks, they're really points. They're indicating the points of um, where those touch. So this 
is 3 feet, which means that this little piece right here that's really hard to see is also 3 feet, which means that this one must be 5, which means that this one must be 5, and this one must be 4. That's important because now I know that this segment right here from here to here is also 4. All right, but then I'm stuck because I have this whole segment here and this whole segment here, and all I know is that together they're 12. Well, guess what? Since I'm just finding the perimeter, that's sufficient. I don't actually need to know what the length of this is and what the length of this is. I just need to know that all together, so let me just draw an arrow, that and that all together are also 12 feet. I don't need to know whether it's 6 and 6 or 7 and 5 or you get the picture. I just need to know that together they are 12 feet. And then I can go ahead and add up all the sides. So I added 12 plus 12 plus 3 plus 8 plus 9 plus 4 and I get 48 feet. When we give this to you on a test or quiz, it's going to be much more like this or like this and not at all like this. So go ahead and you know just remember when you see a circle and that polygon circumscribes it, that the concept that we're looking at is that tangents from a common external point are congruent, and you're going to need to use that. Okay, this is a good place to end this section of the notes because we're done talking about segments and we're about to start talking about angles. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this here. Please be sure you go on to part two. All right, welcome to part two of notes 10.1 to 3, and we're going to start talking about some arcs and some angles. And we're going to begin with talking about minor arcs. So minor arcs are arcs that measure less than 180 degrees, and the measure of a minor arc is equal to the measure of its central angle. And this expression right here, the little m with the arc over it, means the measure of arc AB. So we know that the measure of an entire circle is 360 degrees. The measure of a major arc, which is an arc that's greater than 180 degrees, is the difference between 360 and the measure of the related minor arc. The measure of a semicircle, semi means half, so is 180 degrees. So here you can see we've got the measure of arc AB. Well, the central angle is 50, so the measure of arc AB is also 50 degrees, and then the measure of arc ADB, and I know it's a major arc because it's got these three points, so it's the arc that starts at A, goes through D, ends in B. It's 360 minus 50, which gets me 310 degrees. So that being said, please find me the measure of arc RTS in the diagram at the right. Come back when you have your answer. Hit pause now. And it is, of course, 315 degrees. Moving on. So already in geometry, we have had a segment addition postulate and an angle addition postulate. So should, it should come as no surprise to you that we have an arc addition postulate. And it simply states that the measure of an arc formed by two adjacent arcs is the sum of the measures of the two arcs. So the big arc equals the two smaller arcs added together. The measure of arc ABC is equal to the measure of arc AB plus the measure of arc BC. Very straightforward. Okay, so here we have a circle graph. It's about an investment group, but honestly, it doesn't really matter what it's about. Uh, they just want to know what the measure of BD is, arc BD, and the measure of arc BCD. So go ahead and find those two, please, and come back and check your answers when you've got them. Hit pause now. All right, so this one was 160, which means this one must be 200. How did I know that BD went this way? and not this way? Well, if I go this way, the arc is greater than 180 degrees, so it is a major arc, so it would have had three letters in it. BD is the minor arc. It's got to be less than 180 degrees. Simple enough. Okay, so here's another theorem that we've got, which will help you solve some problems, and it says, in a same circle or in congruent circles, right, which is an important thing that a lot of students kind of gloss over, Two minor arcs are congruent if and only if their corresponding chords are congruent. So by corresponding chords, it means that the chords that intersect 
the endpoints of the arc. So if this is chord AB, then it intersects arc AB. So that's the corresponding chord. So arc AB is congruent to arc CD only if segment AB is congruent to segment CD. All right, here are a couple more critical theorems that are really going to help you solve problems in this unit. And the first one states, if one chord is a perpendicular bisector of another chord, so here we have chord SQ, and it is perpendicular and bisects chord RT, then the first chord is a diameter. So QS here is the diameter. All right, so that's a very important um, theorem. And very useful in real life, as you will see when we do some activities in this unit. Okay, and then furthermore, if we have a diameter of a circle and is perpendicular to a chord, then the diameter bisects the chord and its arc. So if EG here is a diameter, and we know it is because it goes through the center of the circle, then EG is perpendicular to DF, and HD is congruent to HF, and furthermore, arc... Um, DG is congruent to arc FG. All right, so all these things are true. These two are congruent and the two arcs are congruent. Very important theorems on this page. All right, so here we've got circle E and we name circles by their center point. We need to find the length of segment BD and we need to justify our answer. Well, AC here is clearly a diameter because it is a chord that goes through the center of my circle which means that it, if, it, if it is perpendicular to another chord, then it must also bisect that other chord. So that means that BF here is also 6, which means that BD is 12. And we just justified it using that theorem. So if diameter, then perpendicular bisector would be my justification. Um, okay, and then we have another theorem here that says in the same circle or in congruent circles, two chords are congruent if and only if they are equidistant from the center. So in this example here, chord AB is congruent to CD if and only if EF, e, segment EF is congruent to or equals, uh, it's equals, I should have left out that segment symbol, shouldn't I, um, EG. Okay, so this has to be true. If that's true, then these two chords are congruent. Another important thing to remember. Also, notice how um, there's this right triangle here. We know that distance is always the perpendicular distance from a point to a line. So the nice thing is, is we've got a right angle here, and then we've got pos the possibility of forming some right triangles by using a radius. So all kinds of opportunities open up when we've got something like this going on. All right, let's solve some problems using what we know. So in this, we are given a little segment here and a chord here, and we are told to find the radius and the measure of arc AB. Interesting. All right, so how should we go about this? Well, one of the keys to this unit is going to be, if you can form a right triangle, by all means do. And particularly if you can form it by drawing a radius. So we can draw a radius right here. Or we could draw a radius right here. Both of those are going to give us right triangles. Furthermore, this is also a radius. And it's perpendicular to this chord, which means that it bisects that chord. So this is true. It's perpendicular, it bisects it, it's on the diameter it's on the diameter and is perpendicular, therefore it bisects, which means that we have 12 and 12 going on. So this segment here is 5, this segment is 12, which means that the radius must be 13. So radius equals 13 feet. Very straightforward. If you didn't remember your Pythagorean triple, you could always do the Pythagorean theorem, okay? And you would have gotten a radius of 13 feet. That was the easy part. How about the measure of arc AB? How the heck am I supposed to find the measure of this arc? Well, I know that if I want to know the measure of this whole arc, it's got to be equal to the measure of this angle right here. So that begs the question, how do I find the measure of that angle? Well, 
I do have a right triangle, and I do know all of the sides. So I should be able to find the measure of that angle. What do I have to use to relate a triangle's sides to its angles? Oh, if you yelled out trigonometry, good for you. You are correct. So let's do some trig. All right, so we are looking for angle C right here. We're actually going to find half of angle C and then double it. So um, let's just use whatever pieces we want. Uh, let's use this leg and this leg, the 12 and 13. So from the perspective of C, I have my opposite and I have my hypotenuse, which means I'm talking about sine. So the sine of C is going to be equal to my opposite over my hypotenuse. Since I'm looking for an angle, I'm going to have to use the inverse. So C is going to equal the inverse sine of 12 over 13. So what's the measure of angle C? Well, my handy-dandy calculator in degree mode, remember if we're using trig, we have to be in degree mode, tells me that this angle right here of my right triangle is about 67.4 degrees. So when I double it, the whole angle C, so this is really half C, the whole angle C is going to be twice that, so about 134 degrees, uh, 0.8 degrees. So we're going to go with about 135 degrees. Well, if that's the measure of my central angle, then it's also the measure of my arc. So the measure of arc AB equals 135 degrees. You will have to use trig in this unit. Okay, this problem down here is pretty straightforward, so I am going to ask you to do that in the notes check. All right, here we have a circle. This chord is x, the radius is 12, and the chord intercepts an arc of 120 degrees. We need to find the value of x. How are we going to do this? Well, remember, one of the keys of this unit is if you can make a tri right triangle, make a right triangle. And even better, if you can do it by drawing a radius, go for it. So I'm actually going to draw two radii. I'm going to draw this one because now I know that the measure of this angle right here is 120 degrees because that's equal to the measure of its intercepted arc. And then I'm going to draw a second radius right here because I know that if I have a diameter and it's perpendicular and I drew it perpendicular to oops perpendicular to this then it bisects that chord and it also bisects the angle which means that now what I've got going on is I have two 60 degree angles which is important because that means that this angle right here, because it's the same as this intercepted arc, is also 60 degrees. So I have a right triangle going on, right triangle, ooh, terrible right triangle, but go with me here, that has a hypotenuse of 12. This is 1 half x, right, because the whole thing is x, so this is 1 half x, and this angle right here is 60 degrees. So I got some options here. This is a special right triangle. That's exciting. So let's do it using our special right triangle rules. Do you remember the pattern? Well, the pattern is short leg is x, long leg is x radical 3, and the hypotenuse is 2x. Well, our hypotenuse is 12, which means our short leg is 6, and our long leg is 6 radical 3. Now, I could have used trig here, but it would not get me my answer in simplified radical form. And remember, if you can do it using a simplified radical, you must do it using a simplified radical. So uh, the way to go here is definitely with my special right triangle. All right, so what this means for my situation here is this is 60, so this one must be the 6 radical 3 one. Well, if that's half of the whole, then I just need to multiply it by 2, so times 2, to get my answer, which means that x not this x, but the x in our problem, equals 12 radical 3. And that's my answer. Not so bad. All right, let's talk about this problem down here. Um, here I have a diameter and a radius and a chord. And there are a couple of options here. 
but you haven't learned some of them yet, so I got to think about this one. All right, let's do it this way. So if this is 86, then this is 86. Since this is a diameter, that means this part over here must be 94. What should we do? Oh, let's make a right triangle, Mrs. Yukin. Yes, let's make a right triangle. So we draw a radius that is perpendicular to this guy here. And now we have bisected, which means we have a side of 10. And we've bisected this, which means that we've bisected this. So we've got basically a 47 degree angle going on here. Right? Okay, so we have a right triangle, a side of 10. We're looking for the hypotenuse, and we know an angle. So we are going to have to use trig once again. Please go ahead and solve this problem and come back when you have your answer. Hit pause now. All right, we have the opposite and hypotenuse, so we would have used sine, sine of 47 equals my opposite 10 over my hypotenuse x, rearrange it into my calculator ready format, and I find out that x equals 13.7. So this concludes today's notes. I realize they were long and covered a lot. Um, we'll get to practice it in class, but it's really important that you have these concepts down solidly. This unit is a difficult one especially if you don't pay attention to what's going on. It's not always super intuitive, and you're going to need to memorize these formulas and do a lot of practice problems in order to be able to be successful in this unit. As always, please go on and do the notes check, and if you have any questions over anything we've covered, please be sure to ask in class. Thanks.